Kim to počali hovoriti i šajmajmo vami, bo zvati duh da vim tako sladnist. Utičaj pobožnje judaj zvrniš krajin svitim žuru za Rusalini. Koli pro lunar se zvuk vibravi si je veliki nevcov. I vzdi ludi val a divi vali si je zvoto pobižen iz njuh počor svojo ribu muzu. Well done. Well done. So if you could put up the first one there, Evan, the all the places you'll go, please. So it's a critical story in my life. Um, it's a messed up story, to be honest. And this is a critical book as I was growing up. So I'd like to read you a couple of pages. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on, and you'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump, and the chances are then you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for so much fun. The unslumping of yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked, some windows are lighted, but mostly are darked. A place that you'll sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn to your left or to your right, or right and three quarters, or maybe not quite, or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find for a mind maker upper to make up his mind. And you'll get so confused that you'll start into a race down long wiggled roads at a breaknaking pace and grind on for miles across a weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place. So I was born and raised in Montreal, went to a private school. So the first one was Selwyn House. I graduated from Centennial Academy. Had a great life, certain parts. So I came from a single parent home. My mom did four jobs. She was a parent, she was a nurse, three different hospitals. But also, oddly enough, as I was growing up, I never really understood this, is that she had, we had a duplex, and upstairs were those people with, at that time, called disabilities. Autism, uh, grand mal seizures, um, vision issues. And so my mom, at 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, she would go to work, come back, and say, okay, I have these people upstairs. You need to help them. You need to walk with them. You need to guide with them. You need to give them medications with the person supervising you. You need to do this stuff. I have to go off, and I've got to pay these bills. Can you do this, Steve? And can you do this, Mike? I'm like, yeah, it's all right. Sure. So year after year, I never really understood that, the consistency of hard work. And so she would get literally three to four hours a night she was constantly going and running. And those private schools cost about eight to $10,000 per child per year. So you got two boys, eight times two, 16. So you are hustling every single day, every single paycheck, because you have been raised in a condition, Barbados, you give your best to your child. You gotta sacrifice yourself, you do it because a child is the next generation, the next step up. So in those moments of Montreal, going from high school, I went to CJEP, Vanier, had a great time there, played rugby, good times. Then I got early acceptance in McGill University. I thought I was the king. I was like, I got early acceptance in one of the best schools in the world. There you go. But my whole issue, or well, many issues, was I loved football. Yeah, I went to church since I was five years old, literally, sung in the choir. But it came to football, that was my God. I didn't care about the Bible, didn't care about Jesus, didn't care about all of that nonsense to me. I was like, you give me football, we can play. And so in those moments in which my mom could never come to a game, to a practice, nothing, I had a chip on my shoulder. So I can remember clearly, there was one day in which we had the football game, and I was, little Billy is playing out in the field, and the mother's going, oh, Billy, I, oh, my boy, Billy, yes. And I was like, all right. So Billy's your son. I'm going to lay him out. And I did. I was like, all right, Billy, get on up now. Mama ain't clapping for you now, is she? And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, Lord, Billy, Billy, why? 
Anyway, this is a consistent theme in my life on this, whatever sport it was, I will dominate you. You are my enemy. So you got especially parents in the crowd. I was like, I'm going to show you up because my mom can't be here. So I'm going to take my anger out on you. It's fair. Be it basketball, rugby, whatever it is. It's a fair field. So growing up, I was very blessed to have a mother who cared for me and loved for me. But then on that date, December 28th, 1996, she died. And that's when, to be honest with you, all hell broke loose. I was blessed to have Tracy in 2008. She changed me, but she also challenged me. And she said this, you're one angry black man, and you always say you're a Christian. How in God's holy name do you curse and swear and get drunk and do a whole bunch of nonsense, but then you can honestly believe that God will forgive you for this nonsense? I was like, God's forgiving. Uh, it doesn't work that way. You can't consciously, overtly do nonsense and think God goes, oh, that's okay. There's no consequence to this. And so at that time, she had four-month-old Trinity. And she says, if we're going to go and have a relationship, you've got to smarten up. So as an ignorant dude, I was like, who are you to tell me how to behave? Do you know who I am? She's like, yeah, I do. You're a scared little boy. And I was like, damn, you pulled me out. <laughs> you unabashed called me out. She says, yeah, I am. Everyone I loved has died, and therefore I can't take this nonsense. She says, okay, I'll walk with you. But you have to change. You have to listen to God. You have to pray. You've got to let go of this anger and this nonsense because it's only killing you and poisoning people around you. And no one wants to deal with that nonsense. All right, fine. So in three years, she slowly changed me and still is changing me. Got married May 7, 2011. Praise be to God. And in that moment of time, from 2011 onwards, she has slowly walked with me and guided me and helped me in my journey. Even between 2011 and 2013, I had a company called Game Changes, which would, change, would help youth, especially at-risk youth, especially boys, in football and hockey. And so we would go to the gym, work out, all that good stuff. But the whole critical point of Game Changes was to make them to young men, make them responsible. They have a child, they'll be a father to be responsive to the community and so forth. So in 2013, I was met with a good mentor of mine, United Pastor Jeff Crittenden in London, Ontario. And he says, uh, Steve, I think you should become a priest. I'm like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. So I'm going to say, okay, how much does the priest make? Doesn't matter, Steve. Because no, 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 because I will make that much money in one year compared to what you will make. So how much money do you make? It's like 60,000. I'll make that in a year. So you tell me, why should I become a priest? It doesn't work that way, Steve. I just ask you to go to the dean at Huron University College in London. I ask you just to speak to him. Give an hour. Take an hour of your time and speak to him. Do you promise me this, Steve? I'm like, yeah, whatever. I was still geared onto the game changer. I loved it so much. The great kids went to, we went to Louisiana. We went to Ottawa. We went to different parts of the world. It was fantastic. And so in 10 minutes, the dean says, you're in. Got no problem with you, buddy. Just send me your transcripts and we'll be all good. And I'm like, in the next 50 minutes, I fought with this man. <laughs> Literally, I fought with this man saying, I don't want to be a priest. I don't want to have this job. I don't want a plastic tab around my neck and talk about Jesus. I have hatred towards this man. And he goes, ah, it doesn't work that way, buddy. <laughs> you ever read the Bible on how many people got angry at God, but then God turns them around? He's like, well, maybe you should actually read it and then come back to me. So I get home, I'm like, oh man, I can't believe this nonsense. Tracy comes in and says, so how was your meeting with the dean? He says, I'm in. She's like, I knew that already. So you did not know that he would say yes. Because yeah, I did. And then she started listing off dates on which she, I talked about God, the forgiveness of God, the faithfulness of God, our conversations by which the redemption of God, the reconciliation of God, the light of God, she says, I knew this years ago that you become a priest. Because of your anger, now God can use you for other people. You can talk into their lives and who are going through struggles on suicidal thoughts, on mental health issues. You can talk to those young men who are struggling because they have no dad. God can use you in this position. That's why I wanted you to go and talk to this man. So it's plain as day. 
So I enrolled in 2013. And for the next three years, went through seminary. A critical piece in my transformation was in Clay, in Kamloops. So I was in the car with the dean, the present dean, Todd Townsend, and we're driving in the car, the beautiful mountains, the scenery is fantastic. And we're talking about something, and the voice said in my head, are you ready? I said, ready for what? Are you ready now to take this vocation seriously? Are you now really ready to take my word and to go to the people? Are you ready, Steve? Because if you are, I got surprises for you. So I'm thinking, and Todd's talking, and due respect to Todd, I didn't hear what you said, sorry. And we're talking, he's talking, and I'm like, yes. Verbally I said, yes. The next two years were a blur. Do I remember the courses, remember the teachers and friends and colleagues? But instantly I knew God said, I need you, Steve, to help these people. I need you, Steve, to walk faithfully in my love. I need you, Steve, to be a great father. I need you, Steve, to be a great husband. I need you, Steve, to be my servant. I need you. So in all of this tangled mess, which was also unraveled, and the patterns in my life, and the weaving of God's grace, I'm still unfinished. I speak to you today to say that as well, all of us are unfinished works by God. I want to say to you as well, doesn't matter your sexual orientation, doesn't matter your color, your skin, doesn't matter you're tall, you're short, you're black, you're white, you're male, you're female, doesn't matter. God says to you, I need you. I need you to walk faithfully in my love. I need you to trust me in these bad times of, des of despair and of doubt. I will deliver you from all of these worries and of pains. Can you trust me? Do you listen to me? Will you yield to my spirit and help weave the tapestry of love to other people so that I can clothe them in my righteousness? I ask these questions to you. When you say yes, he's going to mess you up. <laughs> Let's be honest. God is not very linear. He'll go, all right, let's go over here for a sec, and come back. He will do this constantly and consistently, but all the time he will comfort you, and he will walk with you, and he will forgive you. Hold those things in your heart. And as well, the Maya Angelou quote, as I said before, there is a great pain, there's a great agony, there's a great struggle if you do not tell your story. I ask of you to do that, to have those threads in your life connect and weave, and therefore you can go to other people and proclaim the good news. Doesn't matter the despair you're in, God is there. Doesn't matter the heights of celebration, God is there. It doesn't matter by which you may be speaking from different languages, different perspectives, different thoughts or education, God still says you're all of my children, and yes, you will speak differently, but also there comes the wall of sound a cacophony by which you'll hear of one word and one message. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's do it again. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. I ask those nine speakers to please come up on stage. If you remember, for today's passage is Acts 2, 4 through 6. And that wall of sound, I purposely wanted to present because that, if you think of that time, you had Greek, you had Roman, you had a whole bunch of languages thrown at the people. People going, what? I can hear my own language. But yet for this next exercise, I ask you to hear on what they're saying and also see what they're going to do. Please. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them ability to speak. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout people from every nation under the sky. When this sound was heard, the multitude came together and were bewildered because everyone heard them speaking in their own language. So may God bless you. May God keep you and protect you. And please remember, you may have a different voice in a different language, but God still comes to all of us and says, we only speak of one Lord, one table, one God, one crucifixion, one Jesus, one body of Christ. Amen. Amen.